good afternoon or good evening to you, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Dr. Dan Jostin Smetowski. I'm the director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Michal Ba'ashar Siegel here to give us our talk for today. Uh, as way of introduction, Dr. Barsha Siegel is a faculty member at the Goldstein Gorin Department of Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. And she is an elected member of the Israel Young Academy of Sciences. During the 2022 2023 academic year, this year, she is the Horace Goldsmith Visiting Professor in Judaic Studies at Yale University. Her first book is Early Christian Monastic Literature in the Babylonian Talmud, which won the 2014 Manfred Lautenschlager Award. Her second book is Jewish Christian Dialogues on Scripture in Late Antiquity, Heretic Narratives of the Babylonian Talmud, which was a finalist for the National Book Jewish Book Award in 2019. And we'll be having links with discounts to both those books in our chat. Dr. Dr. Barsha Siegel's work offers exciting and cutting edge examinations into rabbinic literature and the interactions between Jews and Christians that can be gleaned from it. It's a real pleasure to have her here with us today. And I uh, give her the stage now. So Michal, please. Thank you, uh, share my screen. So hello everyone and welcome to my talk. I'm, uh, I want to start by thanking uh, so much Dan and Camille for, for hosting me and also dealing with this last minute move to all Zoom and the snow that happened here in uh, New Haven just at the very last minute. So thank you for your patience and I'm really honored and, and excited to be here. I told Dan at the beginning that he still owes me dinner at the restaurant so that he doesn't get away without um, that. And thank you all for coming and joining me today. And, and basically what I want to do is do two different things in this talk. I want to talk a little bit about my project as a whole, the, the study of Jewish-Christian relations in the Babylonian Talmud and what it tells us about the history of the time and uh, what it can lead us when we study the history and how can it contribute to the study of Jewish-Christian relations in the past. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about future projects and what can be done uh, when we're talking about um, the study of Jewish Christian relation or what else we could do. So that will be the second half of my talk and will be less textual. So let's start by a little bit of an introduction. So basically what my talk is going to do is uh, is going to talk a lot about the interaction between Jews and Christians. We're talking about late antiquity and the question I want to ask is how they both interact with each other and what uh, that interaction can teach us about real life interaction between those two religions the reason that it matters so much is that, um, well, we tend to sometimes think about um, Judaism and Christianity as being, uh, as, as the, the latter being developed from the former, the Christianity developed from Judaism. The real actual, you know, textual evidence that we have is actually different because the Judaism from which uh, both religions developed, we're talking about rabbinic Judaism, happened at the same time that early Christianity developed. So they actually, those two religions developed side by side in the first century CE. So asking what rabbinic or Jewish sources can tell us about that interaction is actually um, one of the first evidence that we have for that development from the Jewish side. How did they see the interaction? What can we learn about them? And we don't have a lot of evidence about that from the Jewish side, or at least scholarship hasn't been able to dwell too much into that, and we'll talk about this. So this is why this kind of scholarship is new and cutting edge and exciting, and I'm very honored to have been part of that uh, development. What I want to do in addition to that, and I want to add a third element, is the use of some computational tools to talk about those questions, and I'll, that's what I said. I'm gonna, I'll dedicate the last part of my talk to talk about this third um, 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 circle or the third element in uh, the study of the, uh, of the relationship. So when we're talking about the text that we're dealing with today, and this text that's my specialty and that what I do, is called the Babylonian Talmud. Now the Babylonian Talmud is actually, um, I'm sorry, I see that someone's saying that the volume is not very good. Should, should I do something different? Sam, Dan? 
Um, I think if we if people just turn the closed captioning option, that that will help them. Okay, so I'm good on my end. I think so. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll continue. Uh, so basically, the text that we're dealing with is called the Babylonian Talmud. Now, while the Jews are called the people of the book, this is a term that they received from the Quran, referring to the Bible. The the real real uh, book that influenced the Jewish people. In, in a very significant way, up until modern day state of Israel, as we speak nowadays in Israel and its new government, is actually not the Bible, but this text. This is called the Babylonian Talmud. It's an anthology. It's kind of like an encyclopedic, very large and big, as you can see, uh, text that really combines a lot of the notions and theology and praxis and law uh, of the Jews uh, from the first century CE. It was redacted around the sixth or seventh century, but becomes the most important and influential text by the 11th century uh, for Jews. This is the text that Jews live their life with, and they, they really determine what they should and shouldn't do. Uh, that's the text they study. You have uh, pictures here of people studying this text. There's actual institutions of people sitting and studying this, um, um, doing that for a living and studying this text as a sacred text. I also put a picture here of women studying this text. This is new. This hasn't been the case. This text that wasn't open for women to study. Uh, so this is kind of new. The, part, the fact that I'm teaching this is also new. Uh, this text was not uh, um, a text that women studied. It was very male-oriented in its text. So this is a revolution in the study of the text. But in any case, that's the text I'm looking at. And this is the text we'll look at together and ask, what does it teach us about Jewish-Christian relations? So when we're talking about the Babylonian Talmud, um, and the question that I want to ask is about Christianity and the Talmud. And the reason that this is exciting and new is because we have to talk a little bit about the history of the study of Jews and Christians. So that the study of Judaism and Christianity is very much influenced by the history of scholarship. So in the past, um, Jews and Christians, um, the, the, the people who studied these texts were people on the Christian side and on the Jewish side were people who believed this, the text to be sacred. So we had Protestant Christians studying ancient Christian texts. We're talking about the beginning of the 19th century, where we're, we're talking about middle of the 19th century, when the text started being studied critically uh, and look, looking at it for in a, in, a, uh, uh, in a scientific way, looking at manuscripts, looking at historical questions. And from the Jewish side, it was uh, male Orthodox men who looked at the text um, uh, as a sacred text, and both sides were very comfortable with reaching the conclusion that Judaism and Christianity had nothing to do with each other in the Babylonian Talmud. So we see scholars saying, oh, there's no Christianity in the Talmud, there's no need to look for that. Um, and that was a very uh, safe uh, a, a conclusion to reach and study, and, 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 and that the Talmud was kind of like operating in a vacuum and had nothing to do with the societies and cultures around it. This changed in the past 20 or 30 years or so, when we started looking at the Babylonian Talmud as a source for information about Jewish-Christian relations. That's new. Uh, and I'm part of that, and I was fortunate enough to go to Yale and, and write my dissertation there in the, uh, in the Department of Religious Studies. And that's not coincidental that once the Babylonian Talmud was studied uh, in a context of other religion, in the study of religious studies in the Department of Religious Studies, I think that opened up a lot of new ways of looking at the text. And a product of that, in my two books that were just mentioned by Dan, um, deal with that. So I tried in my, in my research to show that the Babylonian Talmud, that very important text that we're talking about, is actually a crucial source that has a lot to teach us about Jewish-Christian interaction. It has information there to tell us about how Jews and Christian interact with each other. They, they can tell us uh, what did the Jews know, what did the rabbis know about Christians, uh, in what way did they react to it? Did they argue with this? Did they polemicize against it? Did they, were they influenced by it? Did they think that some of the ideas that Christian had were good ideas and they should adopt them? Did they think they were all bad? They should be you know, fought against? So the Talmud has a lot to offer to in, in the way to answer that question. We just have to look carefully and even ask that question and look at the text in a way that suggests that there's answers in the text. So this is where my scholarship fits in, and this is what we'll, we'll do today. 
the assumption of my research is basically that a text can teach me about the people who created that text. I'm going to look at the Talmud. We're going to see an example today together. We're going to look at the text and we're going to ask, what does the text tell me about the people who created them? So let's look a little bit about the map. I'm kind of exciting to, excited to show you that because that map didn't exist until I created it just to show you the state of scholarship. This map doesn't actually exist. I had to make it. Uh, when we're looking at the area where the Babylonian Talmud was redacted and created, we're looking at modern day Iran and Iraq. I don't know if you can see my pointer. There we go. So we have the Persian Gulf. This is modern day Iran and Iraq. We have the two rivers leading down to it, the Tigris and the Euphrates, leading into the Persian Gulf. And what I did is I, take, I took a map by a scholar, French scholar uh, who did a map of all the Christian side in that area, in blue, you know, monasteries and cities where the Christians live. And I superseded on top of that, a map done by Shayao Gatmi of Jewish Babylonia. These are all the green sites. And when you put them side by side, the assumption of scholars that Jews and Christians had nothing to do with each other and that the Talmud has nothing to do with Christianity, become something that we have to at least stop and think about. Does it make sense that when Jews and Christians live side by side, look at this area, especially the Seleucid to Siphon, which is just near door to Mechoza. This is the capital of the Christian area. And this is a place where the Jews lived in the Yeshivot and, and study texts. When they're side by side, can we still say that our default assumption is that the Talmud had nothing to do with Christianity or the opposite? We have to stop and say, well, if that's a situation on the ground, that this is where Jews and Christians live side by side, what indeed does the Talmud have to tell me about Jewish-Christian interaction in those first centuries that are formative, important for the formation of those both religions? Okay, so this is so far as we go in terms of the introduction to the text. Now, what I want to do now is I actually want to show you one example from my book. This is taken from my second book. Uh, this is the text that, um, well, there, um, sorry, uh, this is a, a, a text, an example that I chose for my second book uh, called Christian Jewish, uh, Jewish Christian Dialogues and Scripture in Late Antiquity. And my book basically collects a bunch of stories that are uh, prevalent and appear a lot in the Babylonian Talmud about interaction between Jews and Christians, sorry, Jews and Christian, but they're told as if a Jew, a rabbi talks to a heretic, a heretic called the Min, M-I-N, in, 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 in Hebrew. And we have a bunch of stories like that where a heretic comes into the room and asks a question, usually about a biblical verse of a rabbi. And we have a report of that interaction or that conversation that they had. And my book tried to claim that these stories actually preserve an attempt by the rabbis to present a response for Jewish Christian, for contemporaneous Christian argument of the time. So we have a story and that story represents a rabbinic answer to Christian claim. So that's the overall argument. And let's do one of those stories. This is a fun one. And we're gonna read this together. So this is where we start. So this is found in, in Tractate Hudim. And this is the text that we have. Okay, so the story starts like this. Come in here. That's the beginning of the story. A certain mean, again, a mean is a word that means heretic. One said to Rabbi, right? So we have a conversation between a heretic and a rabbi. When we say rabbi without pointing his name, we mean usually Rabbi Judah, Judah the prince, Rabbi Judah Hanisi, who lived in the second century, in the end of the second century in the land of Israel. So we have theoretically a conversation reported between a heretic and rabbi. And then he, the following, and then the heretic says the following. He who formed the mountain did not create the wind. And he who created the wind did not form the mountain. As it is written, for lo, he who forms the mountain creates the wind. Okay, so this is the beginning of the conversation. We have a heretic walking into the door, meeting a rabbi and saying the following, the verse in Amos, this is a, a one of the prophets uh, talks in, talking about the end of time. And he quotes that verse and says, according to this verse, he who formed the mountain and created the wind, according to this, there were two creation processes. One that had to do with creating the wind and one that had to do with creating the mountain. 
Now, it seems like the heretic, the reason he's saying that is because there are two creation verbs in the, in the, in the verse, right? We have forming and creating, right? Forms the mountain and creates the wind. Now, everyone who reads the Bible know that this is a lot of the time just a technique of the Bible, parallelism, to vary the, the language and to make it seem, you know, more rich. Uh, but in this case, it seems that the heretic learns something about the creation of this world or the process of creation of creating two different processes of creation based on those the use of the two words. Okay, so that's the question that the heretic asks. And I want to stop here and, and say to you, while we read this story, I want you to think not just about the content of the story. I also want us to think, why would anyone create that story? And why would that be preserved for us in 2023 to read that in Boston or in New Haven, wherever you're, you're joining me via Zoom? So that means it, it was kept in the Babylonian Talmud for, what, 1,500 years? Why would that story be preserved? Why is it trying to say? Right? So that's a question about the verse. Is that a good question? What do you think? Is that a good one? Is that something worthwhile to preserve? Right? So that's the question. Now, then we have the continuation of the story that the rabbi replies. And he says to him, you fool. What kind of question is that? Right? Look to the end of the verse. Just read a few more words in the verse and you'll see the answer to your question. What's the answer? The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. We know, you know, who, who, who is the creator and what he did. And we can say, we can say exactly what he wanted to do. Because this is, you, you just, it, it, and it's easy to solve that, right? You just have to read on in the verse. And when you read on in the verse, you find out exactly who, you know, who, re who read that, who read that, who created the, both the, the mountains and the wind, and it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a mystery. Just read on in the verse. So we see that the question of the heretic is not that great, and the answer is kind of simple, right? So that's what the story, and again, I, I want to remember that my question is, why would anyone preserve it? Now, the, the heretic doesn't like that answer, and he says to him, are you a fool you call me? Did you dare call me that? He says, give me three days time, and I will bring you back an answer. So the story continues by saying that the heretic doesn't like that rebuke. And he says to him, do you know how like you, when you lie in bed after a long day and you rethink something that happened to you during the day and you're like, oh, I should have answered that. And you don't have a good answer on the spot, but you're like, oh, if I just had a few more days, I would have an answer to it. It's the same thing that's happening here. So the heretic is like, he knows he has an answer. He just doesn't have it on the spot. It's like, give me three days, be back with you with an answer. I'm going to stop here for a second and I try to suggest my conclusion to the mystery. So basically, again, my question is, what's happening? What's going on here? What is this story and why is this preserved? Now, when you see scholars from the 19th century and the 20th century reading these stories, they basically say, oh, it's a stupid heretic, foolish one, to use Abi's word, doesn't understand the verse. Okay. I don't like that answer. Because I want to know why would the Talmud preserve such a question? If it's an easily refutable one and very easily refutable, just read on in the verse and you know the answer, right? So my question is, what is this? And basically what I try to do in my book is try to say that these stories become clearer or they're not clear to us because we're missing information. And the information that we're missing is how these verses were read by Christian audiences. If we are aware of the way Christians read these verses, we will understand the questions and answers better. And that's what we're missing to decipher the, the story. And the way I want to turn now is basically turn to the verse at the, at the center of the argument, right? The heretic comes in with a verse. I want to see what the Christians are doing with these verses. So this is the verse, and it's found in Amos uh, 4.13. Uh, you can see on the right the Hebrew. And we have to talk a little bit about reading scriptures in ancient, ancient times. So the Jews read the Bible in Hebrew, what we call the Masoah, Masoraic version. But Christians, when they read the Bible, they don't read it through the Hebrew in most cases. They actually read it through the Greek translation of the Torah, or the Bible in general. That Greek translation is called the Septuagint, and it was done by different people. Different books were translated by different people in different time phrases. 
But this is how the Christian read the Bible. Now, the cognitive translation, we often have different versions of some of the verses. And especially when we kind of move on to the prophets or the writings at the end of the Bible. And this is the case in um, Amos as well. Now, Amos was translated, this is what Paul is saying, towards the, uh, the second century BCE. So way before Christianity, this translation was done. And now what's interesting about this is that when we look at the verse, let's look at the verse in the Hebrew, right? So the verse says the following. For lo, he who forms the mountain and creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to men makes the morning darkness with dread on high places on the earth, the Lord, the God that poses his name. So this is a verse that praises God, right? God can form mountains, create the wind, and he can reveal his thoughts to men. God can read minds. That's what God says. In the Hebrew, God Magid la Adam ma psycho. God can read humans' minds. That's the Hebrew. When we look at the Christian version, we see that this is actually happens quite a lot. That when the Hebrew is a little bit hard or difficult, the Greek translations actually present something else. And this it's focused on these words, right? Ma psycho, right? His thoughts. When God tells him and his thoughts. Actually, we see that the Greek translation took the words his thoughts in the Hebrew, which are, if you hear the Hebrew, masticho, and translated it, he tells his men his Christ, right? God will tell men who his Christ is. Why? Because masticho turns into meshicho, right? So from masticho to meshicho. The Greek translation, the translator basically translates the verse to say, God tells his men, not his thought, but his anointed. Ton Christon Otu, right? Christ, Christon, Christus, right? So God tells his men he is Christ. Now, again, this was done in the second century BCE. This was way before Christianity, but when Christians read this verse later on, a few hundred years later, when Christian reads this verse, automatically this verse becomes very, very important for Christian tradition. And not, first of all, because it talks about Christ, right? But it also, talks about something else. It also talks about the creation of the wind. Now, wind in, in, in Hebrew is ruach, and in Greek, pneuma. And ruach actually has two meanings. It has the meaning of wind, something that blows, right? But also spirit, or the Holy Spirit. Now, this is where we have to stop and talk a little bit about Christianity. When Christianity starts, we have the Trinity, right? We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, early Christians deal a lot in the first 300 years about the connection between the Father and the Son. And they argue about what can, you know, what's the connection between them? Is the Father the same as the Son? Is the Son the same as the Father? Do they have the same power? So 300 years, Christianity deals with that. So 300 years, it kind of reach a, a conclusion, a theological conclusion. But then in the fourth century, they kind of remember that there's a third element that they need to discuss, which is the Holy Spirit. Now they ask, is this the same as the other two? Does it the same, the same um, status? Is it not? Is it yet? And guess which verse becomes a very important verse? This verse in Amos. Because this verse in Amos says that God created the Ruach, created the Pneuma, right? God created the Ruach. And the question is, does this verse describe the creation of the Holy Spirit? And now, if the Holy Spirit was created, then it's not as powerful as the Father and the Son, because they are creators, not create, not creation. Or does this verse not talk about the Spirit at all, but just talk about the wind? And then that verse doesn't have anything to do with theological problems. And we hear in the fourth and the fifth century of different groups within Christianity, some say this verse described the creation of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, that verse proof that the Holy Spirit is not as important as the other two. While others say, no, 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 this verse has nothing to do with the creation of the Holy Spirit. It talks about the wind. So, having said all that, I want to go back to my story. And I want to basically claim that the reason that this story seemed stupid and uncomprehensible, and we didn't understand what the heretic was asking, now that we know that there were heretics asking about the creation of the Holy Spirit, I want to read that question into the question of the heretic and ask again. So I think what's happening here 
is that we have a Christian heretic walking into the door and asking the following question. He who forms the mountain did not create the wind. And he who created the wind did not form the mountain. He's saying, listen, Amos talks about the creation of the Holy Spirit. This is about the Ruach. It's not about the wind wind. It's about the spirit. Ruach has a spirit. And it's about the creation of the Holy Spirit. This is an argument we know that some Christian groups are saying. And now his question makes total sense. Why is that a serious question? It's not a stupid one. It's not a simple one. That's a serious question. Does the verse in Amos talk about the creation of the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? That's something that we need to discuss and answer. That's a real question. And having said that, the answer that Ravi gives him is not that great, right? Because he just says to him, you know, read on to the verse. It doesn't solve the problem, which kind of leads me to the rest of the, of the story. So that's my suggestion. My suggestion to us is that we read this verse and say, okay, this story basically deals with a Jewish Christian, a, a rabbinic knowledge of a Christian argument. That the verse in Amos talks about the creation of the Holy Spirit. And this, the rabbinic story, is very anxious about that reading and want to disprove it. And he knows that some Christian group are reading this. That's my suggestion. Now, I wanna, what I want to do is basically read on into the verse and kind of see what the rest of the story does to try to prove that I'm right. So let's read on in the story. So remember, Rabbi says to him, you know, read on in the verse, and he says, I'll be back after three days. So let's read on in the story and see what else. So the rest of the story says the following. Rabbi fasted for three days. So remember he said, I'll be back in three days. The story tells us what Rabbi was doing during those three days. He actually fasted for three days. So the other one would not find an answer. By the way, don't try it at home. It usually doesn't work so well, and the rabbis don't usually do it. They don't fast for this. And so all of a sudden, you can sense the anxiety, right? Rabbi's worried. The rabbis are telling us that he's worried. And he says that when he was about to, when he was about to break his fast after three days, at the very, very last minute, he's waiting. The guy doesn't come back. At the very last minute, they said to him, like, I, I kind of imagine like a butler from Downton Abbey standing at the door saying, <clears throat> I know you're hungry, you haven't eaten in three days, you want to eat, but the heretic came back, right, at the very, very last minute. And he said, because he's so pressed, he said, oh, so they gave me gold for food, and for my first, they gave me vinegar to drink. Oh, my God, I'm so thirsty, and they gave me vinegar instead of food. So, uh, but then we find in the story that not the first guy comes in, but a second heretic, a second Christian walks into the door. It's not the first one, it's the second one. And that guy comes in and he's so happy. He's like, my master, good tiding, I say to you, good news. What are the good news? The first guy, first Christian, could find no answer, went up the roof and fell and died. That's the story. Now, what I want to do now is focus on two, two things that are interesting in this story. The first is the verse that Rabbi used when he's very frustrated because he wants to eat. And the second is the term good tidings that the second heretic comes in. And by focusing on those two arguments, I basically want to claim that whoever's telling the story is making a mockery and a parody of Christian beliefs of the time. This will prove, I think, that the the whole story is basically a representation of rabbinic engagement with contemporaneous Christian arguments. They're trying to say, oh, we know that this is what the Christians are doing, and we want to combat it, and we want to mock it, and we want to make it fun of it. So let's talk about the first one. Remember when Rabbi is very frustrated, he wants to eat, he hasn't eaten in three days, he's about to eat, and they tell him, ah, oh, the heretic came back after three days. So that verse that he's using to show his frustration. Now, rabbis are very pious. When they're frustrated, they don't curse, they use verses. So he's using a verse from Psalm 69. And that verse from Psalm 69, very, very interestingly, never ever appear in the entire rabbinic corpus. The rabbis never use it. It's not something that they study. It's not something that they use. This is the only time in the entire rabbinic corpus that this verse appears in. Never. The rabbis not, don't have use for this verse. They don't talk about it. They don't study it. The one time they're using it is they're using it as a joke here to show the rabbi's frustration. 
Guess who's using this verse very much? And this is actually a verse that's very, very important in Christian tradition. This is, for example, one example in John. Jesus basically represents in the New Testament, in some traditions of the New Testament, the fulfillment of scripture in himself. And this verse is an important one because that's actually a verse that John tells us when Jesus on his very last moment on the cross, before he dies on the cross, he says, I'm very thirsty. And there's a jar of vinegar there and they give him the vinegar instead of water. And Jesus then says, it is finished. Right? Scripture has been fulfilled in me, referring to this verse, right? This verse has been fulfilled in him, and then he dies on the cross. So this verse in Psalm 69, it's such an important verse because that's the last words of Jesus on the cross referring to this verse in Scripture. Basically, what I'm trying to claim is I'm trying to say that whoever wrote the rabbinic story is making fun of Jesus on the cross, because the rabbi is so frustrated, he's like, oh, they're crucifying me, those heretics, right? I want to eat, I can't eat, I'm so thirsty, they're giving me vinegar to drink, right? They're using a Christian tradition uh, to mock Christianity or to mock Jesus on the cross, and then by thus making fun of it. I'm going to stop here for a second and say some words about that. What do we learn from this about Jewish-Christian interaction, which was the question, remember, this is where we started off. What do we learn about Jewish-Christian interaction in the first century CE? We didn't know anything about Jews and Christian. And for this story, I can actually learn a lot. The first thing is I know that Jews know how Christians read the Amos verse, right? They talk about the, the controversy of whether the Holy Spirit was created or not. Whoever writes the story knows. More than that, he's worried about this because they're so happy when the other guy dies, they don't have to finish the argument. He's so worried about this. He fasts for three days. Whoever writes the story shows that the rabbis are worried. This is a good question that's being asked about scripture. More than that, whoever writes the story knows that within Christianity, there's different opinions about how to read this verse. I kind of skipped a slide that talks about Ambrose, but the church father in, in the fourth and fifth century, church fathers such as Ambrose and Basil and, and Curelius or Cyril, they're all worried about these readings in scripture. So whoever writes the story knows that the second heretic, the second Christian is also worried and he's also happy when the first one dies. So whoever writes the rabbinic story knows that there's inner Christian debates about this verse. Look how much we've learned about the history of Jewish-Christian relation. Whoever writes the rabbinic story in the Talmud knows about Christian arguments within the Christian community about how to read this verse. More than that, look how much he knows. He knows about Jesus on the cross and they're mocking him, which is not very nice to do. But this is what they did in ancient times. They mocked each other. But by this mockery, I can say, well, they were not nice to Christian by mocking Jesus on the cross. but it also teaches me that whoever writes the story knows about the use of Christian or the use of Jesus tradition in Psalm 69. That teaches me that Jews and Christian were in much closer relationship than we previously thought. Jews and Christian were in dialogue with each other. They know about each other. They talk to each other. Otherwise, they can't create that story. You only can create that story if you know about each other's tradition. This is what I'm looking for. And one last example. Remember when the second heretic walks in through the door and he's very happy and he's like, ah, oh, good tidings, good news, I said to you, the other guy's dead. So he uses a word in Hebrew called mevasel to vote. Now mevasel to vote is again, never ever found in the entire rabbinic corpus. It's just not something, you know, we rabbis, we don't do good news, right? It's, it's, it's just not anywhere there. It's the one time in the entire rabbinic corpus was this term appears. Now, good tithing or good news, it doesn't appear in rabbinic literature, but guess who uses that term very often? It means gospel. And in Greek, evangelion, right? Or evangelion, as the rabbis call it. And that actually means gospel. And what's the good news? This is a term that's very early on in the first century, means the good news of the coming back of Jesus. First, after three days. And second, the final coming of Jesus. Now, what does he call good news? What are the good news here in the rabbinic story? The one time that there's good news in rabbinic story is when a Christian say he'll be back after three days. And in fact, he's not back, he's dead. 
that's the good news. That's the gospel of the rabbi, right? The gospel, the good news of the rabbi. He walks into the door and he's like, oh, our gospel, the guy who said he'll be back after three days, he's actually not back. He's actually dead. So this is, again, a way for us to see that whoever writes this story on purpose uses a term that is used by the Christian and turns it on its head and makes fun by using this term. And again, while it's not very nice to do such a thing, and it's very polemic and very, you know, late and take polemics between Jews and Christians, which, you know, we feel uncomfortable with because this is a way of mocking and the other religion, but it also, for me as a historian, teaches me that whoever writes that tradition knows enough about Christianity to create that mockery and shows me that Jews and Christians were in conversation and in dialogue much more than we previously thought. So the Babylonian Talmud holds information about Jewish-Christian relations much more than we previously thought. So basically, what I, what I want to do by talking about this example, and I'm going to kind of like summarize what we saw so far, and then talk a little bit about what it means to us and what, it, what, what we talk about this. Um, this example is just one example of many examples. We're just beginning to explore it. And again, my work is part of the works of other scholars where we're just starting to look at the Talmud and look for such examples. But they lead us to ask bigger questions about Jewish-Christian relations in the Talmud. How much Christianity? What kind of interaction? What did they know? What did they not know about Christianity? And I want to use stories such as these to decipher what Jews and Christians knew about each other. I want to talk about what kind of information, how did they do that? And, and I worked very hard to try to prove that. It's very exciting because no one has done it before. And it's kind of nice to, to, to try and, and say for the first time that Talmud can teach us so much about Jewish-Christian relations. Uh, and this is what it has to offer us. And again, I summarize, look at the story. The story is a Christian, is a rabbinic interaction with contemporaneous Christian views. Look how much they knew. They know that they're, they agree with one view of the Christians of reading the verse in Amos. They don't agree with the other one. They know about the use of John. They know about the use of the Evangelion, right? The gospel. They know about reading. Look how much information the rabbinic author had about Christianity, which teaches me as a historian that Jews and Christians we're much more in collaboration. Now I'm gonna use the last five minutes that I have to kind of like quickly show you what my next project is. And this is where computational um, uh, tools can come in handy. What I've been working on recently, and this is new, is taking this finding that I found in my book and try to use network analysis to map it. So we use networks to map complicated sets of information. This is a, a network of roads in America. Look how much information we have, what roads are, what's hubs, what's centers, what's connected to what. The network has been used to map a lot of information on the web. And basically, I want, what I want to do is basically use that information to map Jewish-Christian relations in the Talmud. just want to show you a little bit of the stuff that I do. I'm kind of skipping the, the data. I need, I need to give credit here to my collaborators. This is Yossi. Yossi is a scholar of bats. He studied bats at Tel Aviv University. He is the head of uh, the, the, the School of Segol of Neuroscience at, at Tel Aviv University. And we worked on this project together because he does network analysis of bats. You can see which bats talk to who, who gets food from who. You can see the thickness of the size of the connection between male bats and female bats. Females are in, in white and male in black. And what's the connection and who talks to who. So he does networks of bats. And we actually started working together and did network analysis of some of the stories. So the, the green is the rabbis and their connection to Christian tradition. We slice them by geography and time and, and, and polemics and not polemics. And we try to see quantitatively and qualitatively what that information tells us about Jewish Christian interaction. Just throwing it out there, look, we can use Google algorithm to do all that, which is very, very interesting because it gives me a lot of information big scale information and bird's eye view about the interaction and connection between Jews and Christians, trying to ask what kind of connection there were between Jews and Christians and Jews and rabbinic authors. What's the distribution of them? What did they know? Did they know the New Testament? Did they know early church fathers? When did they did know? What's the level of covenantness? Do they know a lot of details? Do they know some? Or are they engaging in Let's say they know Matthew from the New Testament. What parts of Matthew do they engage in it a lot in one part or not? All of these are questions that we simply don't know yet. And taking stories such as the one we've studied together 
And mapping big picture wise, what we can do with that also leads us to new patterns, things that I can't even tell you, questions that I haven't even asked yet. So all of this can be done by looking at network analysis. And I basically want to do, I want to take that story that we learned together and connect it with a lot of other stories and try to map Jewish-Christian relation, the mess that it is, into one big map. And basically the project is, and this is what I tried to share with you today, is basically taking the sources, the Jewish sources and the Christian sources, and taking the works of scholars such as myself and others, and using network analysis to try to help us ask the bigger question and back to our scholarship. Lastly, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about, sorry, I'm going to skip this and tell you the uh, very last slide and the last two minutes that I have, that I've been working in Israel because of my work with Yossi, right? Yossi and I work together and he's a biologist working on bats and I'm a Talmud scholar. Uh, when we looked at funding to try to fund our project, we found out that funding such an interdisciplinary, right, taking Talmud and biology and network analysis and putting them together, it's very hard to find funding for such, well, such scholarship. Usually people get funded by, you know, doing just Talmud or doing just biology. It's very hard to find funding for something like that. People don't think outside the box in such a way. So what we did is basically we applied to a grant from the Rothschild Foundation and we got 2.2 million shekels and created um, a, a board of trustees from uh, Nobel Prize winners and the head of the ISF, the Israel Science Foundation and heads of universities. And we basically governed a project called Pumbi, a forum for interdisciplinary studies, which basically brings together uh, um, we have money for two rounds, such as this, we already did one, we're going to do the second one in March, and we bring all kinds of scholars from physics, biology, uh, chemistry, history, musicology, art, bring them together and try to foster by academic uh, um, um, uh, speed dating and meeting with, you know, uh, 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 policymakers in Israel, you can see here as well, bringing them all together and trying to create and fund, and we actually fund some scholarship that comes out of these projects and try to promote studies such as myself and Yossi do together in the network analysis of the works that I do. So just to conclude what I try to show you today is basically take um, my own work, which deals with the Talmud, philolo philology of the Talmud and Jewish-Christian relation, and try to ask historical question about the connection between Jews and Christians. Taking it and using network analysis to try to map this relationship and try to get a bigger picture. For this, I need help from scholars outside of my field who do computational tools such as network analysis, in this case, Yossi. And lastly, I use this as an example to try to influence the larger funding agencies in Israel to try to fund more and more research such as this, so we can learn more and more about studies such as Jewish-Christian relations, but others as well, and try to promote basically collaborators between uh, scholars from the humanities and scholars from other fields, which I, that my study, my own study, is part of this larger um, uh, project. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you very much, Michal. That was really fascinating. Um, I actually wonder if, uh, before we get to the questions, if you could just take us back to that slide where you're doing a, a, a network analysis of your, our narrative from Huleen and just maybe say, maybe three more minutes worth of just how your network analysis works Perfect. Um, as kind of general that, principles. So that, I think that this is really a fascinating topic for our audience. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So let's start with this one, and then I'll explain what I did. Um, so first of all, this is, um, well, this is a simple uh, um, um, map of the connection between Jews and Christians. So let's see what we see here, right? So we see the, the story in Huli, that's the story we read, it's in green, green are the rabbis, right? We put it in the center. And then I connect all the Christian sources to it in dots and lines, right? So this is what, so let's say um, John, remember when John uh, is using Psalm 69, so this is the, the connection between the tradition in John and the story in Huli, or Evangelion, the word of the Christian for good news connected to that. Now, all the Christian traditions are mapped according to the timeline, right? So from, this is when the Christian tradition were created around. Uh, but also what I did, we did is we gave width, right? How, how sure we are of the connection. Uh, so uh, you can see some of the lines are thicker than others to show that. 
something else that we did is we actually took another um, Jewish tradition, another rabbinic tradition, who also knows Evangelion, the use of this, and we added that too, so we can actually say if two rabbinic sources know of a third Christian tradition, is there a connection between the rabbinic sources themselves, right? So we did basically show that in one image, the rabbinic story in the middle, with all its connection to Christian sources. Also, I don't know if you can see, I also mapped in color and geography. The, the, the more light blue is the more Western, Ambrose is all the way to Rome, and the darker blue is more to the east, to the land of Israel. So that's one. But then I took the same map, the same interaction network, and I spliced it differently. So it's the same map, look at that, the same sources, and we have a timeline, the X and Y, right? So we have a Y axis, which is the timeline of the Christian sources. And we have geography, right? So Ambrose is all the way to Rome, and we have Cyril in from, from Egypt, and we have so we have the, the, the geography as well. Didn't do anything else. This is the Hulin story, and these are all the Christian sources. But in this case, what we did is we color-coded the line itself. And we did, we said, uh, we're going to color all the sources that mock Christians, right? Who, who does a polemic uh, uh, view of Christianity when they do that. We're going to we're gonna do it in red. Now, and all the things that the, the, the rabbis show that they knew about Christianity but without mocking it, just showing familiarity in black. Now, look what happened to me. I didn't know that these were my sources. I worked on it. But I'm at Vangel Yossi and I created this network. I wasn't aware of the fact that look at the timeline. Something happened that the earlier sources are treated with mockery and polemics. And the later you move in time, the rabbis are more comfortable addressing Christian issues without mocking. I didn't know that. I, wasn't I didn't notice that until we mocked it. Now, is this a coincidence? Is it just in the story or is this a, a pattern that I can actually find in rabbinic literature as a whole? That the more we advance in time, the less polemical the interaction with Christianity is? I don't know. I haven't done all the work yet, but this is at least ask, you know, proposing me another question. Let's take another one. Look at the geography, the, the geographical spread. This is the more we advance in time, the more spread out the Christian views that the Talmud knows, meaning as time progressed, the rabbis know more Western tradition than before. Is that something that we can actually say is consistent all through the Talmud? I don't know. We just started doing this map. So the, 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 the mapping itself, first of all, organize all the information in one snapshot, which is important in itself, but it also suggests new patterns. A new question, a new scholarly question that now I have to go back to the sources and ask them just because I use this map. Dan, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that uh, that that is perfect. I think that gives us just enough. Uh, I think this is really fascinating. Um, I'm sure we're going to generate some questions out of this. Um, sure. We've been tracking some questions posed in the chat. I'm going to wor work through them as we receive to them. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get more coming in um, as you talk. I'm also going to be, just for the people who pose the questions, condensing uh, these slightly as well. So first from uh, Noah Shine, who, who's asking about the the, um, the Septuagint translation from the from the the passage. So does that move um, from uh, uh, that that kind of move from talking about his thoughts to his Messiah, is that a scribal error? Or is that something that's deliberately done within the context of the Septuagint? Is there any scholarship on that? Or what's your conjecture? So very, very good question. So the question is, when someone translates his Christ instead of his thought, was this on purpose? So there are three options. Is this on purpose? Is this a mistake? Or does he have a different version than we have? And we actually see all three examples, all through the Septuagint translation. Sometimes you can see that the guy didn't understand the word and it's just, you know, sticking something in. So a lot of the time it happens when it's words that appear rarely. So meshich or sticho is actually in hafax legomena. It only appears once in the entire Bible. So that could have been the case here. He didn't know what it means, sticho. So he kind of like went on to the next word that he knew. It could be a geological change, meaning someone who was messianic now you could do you could do messianic messianism without before christianity because second temple judaism was full of messianic beliefs 
before Christianity. Christianity actually is one of the outcomes of that time period. So even before Christianity, people were looking for Christ and Messiah all over in Judaism, including and a lot of different groups that were in the time. So that could have been the case, someone who has ideological motivation, or he had a different version. Someone, made, they made, made the mistake or made the change before that, and he's just translating, and now we know that there was another version that happened to be around. What's the case here? Don't know. But it's it kind of like, it's a kind of a telling, the fact that Sicho is a half dominant, only appears one that kind of like tilted to some kind of a combination. He didn't know what the word meant. It was close enough to a word that they did mean, he did know. Meshicho is Christ. So mm-hmm. it kind of like connected the two and probably had a messianic agenda. So some kind of a melange of the, of the all could, could work. But these yeah. are questions we are asking in, in critical scholarship. Great, great, yeah. Thank, thank you for joining me. Yeah, and, and yes, indeed. Um, and that leads into, I think, the, the next question. So it's clear that the, the Septuagint translation is being used by Christians for various interpretive means. And so Joshua Johnson, um, asked two questions consecutively, and I'm going to state them and then try to extrapolate us a little bit from here. So uh, I hope you can track this. So first, um, Joshua poses, does the claim that he who creates the mountains uh, but did not create the wind, could that be a reference to a Gnostic sect, a a demiurge um, who is not the creator of the spirit? So that is a question about what kind of Christians we might be talking about here. Also, the question about the use of minim in the Bavli, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, could this suggest that the, there were other Christian slash Nazarene Jews and not Gentile Christians with whom the Tanaim were in dialogue? Um, and so I think one of the questions here that another way I'd state that is when does min mean certain things? And are we describing just Christians in general as min? Or are we describing actually a kind of Christian whom Christians also deem heretical as men? And does that show some kind of deeper Jewish knowledge as well, which I think is what you're trying to gesture towards? Good. So you're basically asking what does mean mean, right? Yeah, right? Which, of course, Ruth Langer here at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning has yeah. also tackled in her work on the uh, Rachel HaManim. So what does the mean mean? That's a good question. Now, uh, we kind of like, we have to talk about the history of scholarship. And when scholarship starts in the 19th century, they look at the word mean or heretic to mean Christians everywhere. That was the assumption that they looked at it as simple Christianity or some kind of Christian, all the same from the beginning. Now, um, and so that, that was like the easy way out. So they talked about Christians all the time. What happens later is that start, scholars started asking the same question of your first uh the 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 the, the I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get the name of the person who asked the question but uh, that that's the, that's the kind of question that people start asking saying wait some of the question in the heretic stories and the meaning stories actually taught sounds gnostics and some of the stories actually sounds Greco Roman and some starts like you know philosophy religion and it's not always or maybe Persian Zoroastrian maybe you know so. Some of the, the, the doesn't work with Christian. What kind of Christian? What kind of group? So people started saying, okay, we have to be much more careful when we talk about heretic stories and heretic sources and try to say, what do they represent? Do they present Christians in general? Do they present certain kind of Christians? I'm past those two stages and I'm, I'm kind of like going back a little bit retro and I'm saying that's true. That's all very, very true. But sometimes heretic stories do refer to Christian stories. And I think these are the ones I examine in my own book. Not all Christians, not all heretic. I'm not making a general claim, but sometimes it is. And I think I try to prove in this story and others that it is about Christian harm. Now, what kind of Christian? That's a different question, right? So in this story, for example, we saw there's two, there's a good heretic and a bad heretic, right? There's the one we are happy that he died, and there's the one we celebrate his first day. So whoever writes the story already knows, regardless of my interpretation of the story. We have a good heretic and a bad heretic. So whoever writes the story knows that some Christians are close to us and some are not. So we see complexity in the, in the argument of Christians as well. In this case, I think I made the case, and I think it, 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 it kind of like works with contemporaneous Christian arguments, such as the one I did about the Holy Spirit and the groups that thought the Holy Spirit was lesser 
than the other two in the Trinity. And I think it should be read in light of that. So that's interesting. One last point about this. The hero, the hero of the story, Rabbi, is actually a guy who lived in the second century in the land of Israel. If I'm right, that story could not have been written about Christian argument before the fourth century, because that argument didn't exist before that. And that kind of means that the Bible is telling us a story that is not about Bobby, and it's not about second century Christianity. It's about much, much later. And that's important, because I think the Babylonian term was being situated later in time, when Christianity becomes much more important and crucial and central, and explain why the Bavli, why the Babylonian Talmud is so engaged with Christianity, because it's later. Christianity is much more prevalent and, and much more uh, something that you need to answer and, and anxiety provoke, right? So that kind of explains the background. So the meaning of these stories would be Christians because they're much more, these are the people we want to engage with and answer questions to. Dan, I can't hear you. Can yeah. Hear me? Uh I'm back. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, that's really rich. I'm trying to think of where to go. We, we have a couple of different branching questions from here. So I'm scanning um, our questions here. Um, I, I think maybe I'll... So part of what I hear you saying is maybe this isn't about very early um, Christianity. And so Ephraim uh, Sama was asking... Uh, could be the first that the first Christians are referring to the creation narrative in Amos four thirteen about this being um, the ruach al pane um, uh, to home. Uh, so this wind that exists before creation. Um, it sounds like you're not locating the story in the narrative in the first centuries, but you're pushing the narrative. In a later time period. So you don't see this as being a debate about the creation narratives per se, but rather about the status of the Christian deity. Good. So we actually, this this is a very good question. Whoever asked that question has knowledge of uh, ancient Christianity. And this is good because the verse in Amos actually features in three central debates at the time. The first is about the announcement of Christ when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, the centers around the, the, the announcements of Christ by God. So that's number one where this verse in Amos appears on. Second is about the creation of the Holy Spirit. And the third is about exactly the creation, right? Because the verse talks about the creation. And this is an argument that's happening all over ancient times. How was the world created? Is it Genesis 1 or Genesis 2? Was the world created from nothing? Or was there ex nihilo, right? Or was the world created slowly uh, out of something that existed and God kind of like, you know, uh, changed it and refined it and added to it? So these are, this is like a big question in the ancient time. And, and Chris, early Christian used the verse in Amos to talk about that too. So you're completely right that this serves as well. What I chose is to focus on the Holy Spirit uh, because the other two are less relevant, I think, to the argument here. Also because the pneuma, the ruach, appears in both uh, the Hebrew and the Greek. The other two, so the the, the Meshichot that Christ doesn't appear in the Hebrew uh, term, right? So I think it's less relevant to the Jewish reader. It's not anxiety producing because Christ is not mentioned in the Hebrew version. Uh, but I think the ruach, the ambiguity, whether ruach means pneuma or wind, or spirit or wind. And pneuma in Greek can also mean wind and spirit. Those two words, uh, in Hebrew and in Greek are shared. And I think that explains why Ravi is so anxious about the Christian question. I have to stop you for a second and say something about the rabbis, which is why I love rabbinic sources. They don't hide their anxiety. I mean, they make fun of Christians in this story, for sure. But they also show us that they're nervous about the Christian reading or the, of these groups reading Amos. They're worried about this. He fasts for three days. Why would he fast? He's so worried about it. They're happy. The second heretic and Abi are so happy the other guy died because the conversation stopped. Don't have to continue arguing this. Someone here is so worried and he's not afraid to say it. So the Christian way of reading scriptures or different groups of Christian is something that bothers the rabbi and they're honest about this. 
which also is very typical of the rabbis. They're always surprising in their honesty and complexity, right? They would mock Christians, but also say, oh, okay, we mock them, but you know what? They make a good point. You have to think about that. That's scary. Did, did God create the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is part of God? That's something that exists both in Judaism and Christianity at that time. So what does that mean? That's something, you know, you have to think about. So this is this is why I love doing Jewish-Christian relations in the Talmud because it, it's complex. People are complex. Arguments are complex. And I think that kind of like represents that. Great, thank you. That's, that's really insightful. And I, I think this is going to keep um, layering for us the, uh, these questions. Um, so uh, a question from Ellen Birnbaum. Uh, she asks, are, the, are these same stories found in the Palestinian Talmud? And so what are the similarities and differences? Um, so is this a conversation mostly ha happening among the Bavli, or are we also f finding it um, in Eretz Yitzrael or in the, the sources coming from there as well? Good. So uh, hi, Ellen. Good to hear you. It's nice that we have some, some friends in the audience. Um, the truth is, is that uh, the Mimim stories or heretic stories are found all over rabbinic literature, but the vast majority of them, more than 90% are found in the Babylonian Talmud. So that's something that the Talmud excels at, right? He, he edits much. And most of those stories are also already, on, only found in the Babylonian Talmud, including this story. They don't have a parallel in the Palestinian Talmud. There is other Minim stories or heretic stories, but not these ones. The vast majority of them don't have parallels. And I have to say, from my work, I kind of think that there's a reason for that, and it's a chronological reason. I think a lot of them deal with Christianity, and they're connected to the fact that the Talmud was redacted later than the Palestinian Talmud. So it, it, it has more time to be exposed to Christian arguments and to, to argue against or to deal with, uh, as opposed to uh, earlier uh, Palestinian sources. Good, good. Uh, that's helpful. And, and here I want to um, pose my own question and so this is to start with with a dating question so from when would you date this passage from Hulin? Uh, like if you were going to guess kind of what strata what can you give you a century uh what sense do you have so usually what i say is no clue right because the tom would have tradition going back if you ask Veredon, Talilan, going back to second temple where first century ce all the way to its redaction in the sixth or seventh century C. So who knows? But so there's different ways to date. You can use names of rabbis mentioned. I think I kind of showed in this story that this is extremely problematic because the rabbis are very free in their use of names and it's not necessarily historical. So I'm very minimalist in that regard. So I don't think that's a good way to date. A lot of the time we just don't know. And so because being a minimalist, I kind of like put it, push it as far as I can. I don't, because I, you know, I know when it was redacted and couldn't have written after Islamic conquest, seventh century. And I don't like, you know, seeing earlier stuff in, in later tradition, but that's the one case where I can actually say, you know what, I can more safely date it because it could not have been written before the fourth and fifth century arguments in Christianity. We don't have a lot of examples such as this, but this is one such example. The argument of the Holy Spirit could not have happened before that, which is very, very cool example, which mm -hmm. I think works with my view, the more I work with those sources, that these stories or these engage on the Christianity belongs to the later strata of the Talmud. Okay. So we're talking about, I think, 5th century, 6th century maybe, so we're yeah. talking about later. That's my assumption. I, don't, I can't prove it. I can tell you, this is like the one example I can tell you, it couldn't have been written before that. And we don't have a lot of examples such as this, but this is a good one. Yeah, so this leads me to my question about kind of geographical context. And of course, you know that um, in the land of Babylon and Talmud, this is develops into what we know as the Church of the East. We have kind of Syriac as, as um, part of the linguistic, uh, it's a Christian Syriac linguistic zone. Um, and so I'm wondering, if you think these debates are reflecting broad Christian arguments, if they're reflecting Eastern Mediterranean Greek arguments, or do you see this as also um, an argument within the context of, of, of the Church of the East, the, the Christian Syriac speaking zone? And, and does that matter for what you're trying to analyze in terms of kind of social relationships? So the... When I started working on this project, we, we, we call this, this is um, the um, 
uh, reviewer number two dilemma, right? So this is a, there's a, when we scholars, we submit articles for evaluation, there's always, the reviewer number two is always mean, right? It doesn't, it's not, mean, not a mean heretic, but a mean, mean. Yeah. A horrible reviewer, right? So my horrible reviewers were always the ones saying, why is she looking at the Talmud for Jewish Christian relations? There's no Christianity in the Talmud that had to deal with that and they had to explain mm -hmm. every time. Yes, there is. We should look at that, whatever. And people would say, well, why is she looking? She should look at the Palestinian sources. There's nothing in the Talmud to talk about Christianity. So that's like the first 10 years of my research. These are the kind of thing. And you can see all my research. I kind of have like a an introduction explaining why there's Christianity in the Talmud. And I had to go through the soul of tradition. I'm very lucky and fortunate that the um this has passed there's kind of like a consensus in research now i think we've kind of like become the consensus that there are there is christianity in the time that's new which is exciting right scott we've managed to convince scholars most scholars that there are christian references in the time and much more prevalent than we previously thought good but my reviewer number two questions is a new one then, and it's your question mm -hmm. meaning we've finally decided to look at Christianity. The Christianity we should look at is the Eastern one, the one in Syriac in that area, right? So when I try to say sometimes there are Western tradition, Christian tradition as well, you saw Ambrose, for example, that I quoted, whatever. And then they say, wait, 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 wait. If there is a connection to Christianity, it has to be Eastern Christianity. Mm -hmm. How come you dare say that the Talmud has references to Western Christianity too, from Rome, from the Roman Empire? Now, I have to go through this whole phase when I say, you know, Christian traditions of the West circulated in the East too, and they were translated into Syriac and whatever. But the truth is, this is just kind of assumption that we have in our narrow head. We kind of look at Christianity we're like, oh, West, Eastern Christianity is very cool. It is. I read Syriac all the time. That's my bread and butter. But why just this? Everything we know about the Babylonian Talmud suggests that it has very direct ties to Palestinian sources. The Talmud looks in basic has a lot of basic strata from the Palestinian Talmud. Palestinian rabbis are quoted on every page of the Talmud, the same structure. So if they knew Jewish sources from the West, why would they not know Christian sources from the West, right? They, they, you know, there was always connection between the two centers. So there's something wrong with us scholars that we keep limiting our options of what to look for. So my assumption is just let the sources talk for themselves. And what I can tell you is that I think the Talmud knows Western tradition of Christianity as well. There were merchants, there were people passing by, they knew all of this. This is the Talmud is a rich text and let it talk for itself be, before we limit ourselves. And Eastern Christianity is a very important source. So we should study it and look at it. Syriac is very cool and, and needs to be studied more. But not just both. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're getting to kind of what my question was pointing to is, is can this tell us more about the complexity of the movement of traditions? And this gets to a question that Franz von Lira, who is our current Corcoran chair at uh, Boston College at the center here, uh, posed. Uh, do these kinds of Talmudic sources give information about Christianity that Christian sources don't give us? Like, oh. for example, the circulation of ideas across linguistic boundaries, or however else you might want to expand on that. I part. love that question. Oh, and I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you in person because your question suggests that we and I are thinking of a very similar thing. So let me talk about my first book, which I didn't have time to talk about. My first book talks about monastic sources, sources of the monks, of the Christian monks, in the Talmud. And I try to suggest that the Talmud actually shows familiarity with monastic sources, and first and foremost, with a with a collection of of, of monastic saying called the, the Apothegmata Patron that Dan knows very well. Uh, this is the sayings of the Desert Fathers, and I try to claim that the Babylonian Talmud knows about. It. And I, I kind of like, you know, came out with this book. And then I got accessed by uh by by Christian scholars that got so excited about my findings because they said, you know, we're lacking information about the circulation of monastic sources in that area. We don't have a lot of information. And I say, yes, so the Talmud is a place to go look for the circulation of materials. And by the way, not just that. We're talking about the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit, knowing about the, that, that argument in that area. Who knows? Whatever. Of course, there's so much to learn about, you know, circulation of materials and interaction and how to think about this is, this is yeah, we have to take into account the Babylonian Talmud as well when we're looking 
at Christian material. This is this is important. It's it's not just important for the study of Jewish Christian relation. It's important for the study of Christianity, of ancient Christianity. Talmud matters for that too. That's my my point. Just as just as much as Christianity matters for the study of Judaism. So it's not just about the interaction between them. It's also about each religion and studying, thinking about each religion in itself. That's great. And this, I think, leads into a question that posed by uh, Leah Abram, uh, Abrahams. I'm sorry. Do Christian scholars today agree with your research argument? I think another way of thinking about that is how is your work being received within the field of the study of early Christianity? Okay, so uh, let's talk about how my work is received in the study of Judaism and in the study of Christianity. I would I would like divide this into. So I think there was a lot of resistance to the study of Christianity and the Talmud in the beginning when this started off. I'm, I'm following in the footsteps of Danny Boyarin and Peter Schaefer and Richard Kalman and Jeff Rubinstein and the whole Brazil and team. Not a lot of us, but there were a few and I'm, I'm part of that group of scholars and there were there was resistance to that at first, uh, especially since really it kind of breaks uh, kind of the, 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 the ideas about uh, the Talmud before. I have to say that personally, I have not encountered that objection from Christian scholars. I actually found this them to be extremely receptive of that, very excited about the possibility of what the Talmud has to teach. It might have something to do with the fact that I say that the Talmud knew Christian sources and it was mocking it, but also very engaged with it and sometimes influenced by it. So I think that conclusion might have helped, you know, soften the blow. But I, I kind of feel that uh, Christian scholars are very interested in that. I, I was, I'm extremely fortunate and happy to have a lot of collaborators within uh, Christian studies, especially in Europe, but also in the United States very, very much. These are my teachers. I, I can't do... I talked a little bit about collaboration with back scholars, but I have to say my first collaborators were with Christian scholars. I couldn't have done my work on my own. I don't have enough information about Christian studies, Christian sources, and I have to use on every step of the way the help of my colleagues, Christian scholars, Christian uh, scholars of Christian sources. And I kind of like say um, uh, the, 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 that these sources uh, are, are I need access, help accessing them uh, using my colleagues. So I, 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 my work is a good example of collaboration between the fields of uh, rabbinic studies and Christian studies. And uh, I have to say, I've been extremely fortunate to have very, very close colleagues that are uh, interested and in, in, in see the way these two interact. So I'm, I, I think we're in a good place in scholarship for that. Yeah, that uh, that's very exciting. Um... I, I want to pose one clarifying question when um, this was posed by um, a couple of our commentators here. Um, when you're talking about the Amos passage in, in the Hebrew, you rendered it as uh, is that God can read human thoughts, mm -hmm. but it seemed like it was God letting humans know the, what's on thoughts. God's mind. So no, no, their thoughts. He tells men their thoughts. Okay. So not telling God them God's what thoughts. What he thinks. Okay, interesting. Well, uh, perhaps uh, our two interlocutors here, uh, Ephraim and Nassan, can can email you separately to continue that okay. exegetical debate. Um, uh, yeah, you know, this is this is what uh, learning is 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 built upon. You know, I, I want to just pose, a, a, I think, a question from the digital humanities now, which is where your project is going, which is a very exciting emerging field for all of us. Um, and uh, 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 Sam Jai, who is our uh, support, our technical support person here, but is also a doctoral student affiliated with our Center for Christian Jewish Learning, is um, uh, asking about how your research is going to be presented in terms of these interactions between Christians and Jews. Are you going to create this to be open access? Um, what does scholarship look like, like this look like for the future? Um, my question was, is it a website? Is it interactive? Is it a book? Is it an ebook? Um, what are the, the the layers of the presenting scholarship um, looking like? And how have you and your team thought through all those questions? That, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. I'm a huge believer in open access. I'm a part of this movement. I think this is something we have to aspire to. Everything has to be done open access. Um, so 
this is just the beginning of a project. We actually just heard that our article is accepted to for publication. So the first preliminary thoughts are going to be published soon. Uh, open access and nature humanities. So that's something that's going to be out there. But the actual networks or the things that we use is expected to be um, uh, open access. But it's more important than that because to make the big projects work, we actually need the most you know, a lot of information about Jewish-Christian relation. Every time a scholar finds a connection between a Jewish and a Christian tradition, I want it to be fed into the system as a whole, it's a big one. And for that, it has to be open, right? There's going to be some kind of like a uh, GitHub or something like that. It's open and everyone can feed in information into. Now, um, for this, we need money. We need to, uh, uh, we need to uh, program, um, computer algorithm to find some of the, uh, well, I didn't have the time to go into that, but distant reading to help us find many more examples. Uh, I, I, you know, our, my networks are based on, you know, stuff that I did by hand in my books and, 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 you know, looking in databases and searching for information, but it doesn't, you know, a computer algorithm can actually find these examples much faster. And so we can do that, but we need people to help us do that. But this big, Knowledge is there, the ability is there. We just have to like actually put it into uh, mm -hmm. to to practice. Uh, so we're we're looking, we're still looking for funding to do the full project. So you get just getting this. I think that's the future. That's my that's my view. I think um, it doesn't replace what I do. I have to make that absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. I am not a computer scientist. I do not do computational theory. I don't do network analysis in my work. I use this as a tool to advance my own work. So this is a, this is a tool, one of the many tools in my toolbox when I do philological historical um, study of the text. It will never replace what I do because I take these examples in this network and I go back to my questions and my things and then I hope to continue reading, you know, writing books, long books that explain this and deal with it and ask questions. It doesn't replace it. It's a combination. Right? We use this as tools to do it. And lastly, and this is, a, I think, a word of warning. Um, some scholars, such as us in humanities, are very scared of digital humanities and digit digital tools because we don't know. I don't know anything. I get scared of an Excel file, you know. So this is this is hard. But collaboration with scholars from different fields actually can help us do interdisciplinary stuff by collaborating with scholars who are, have interest in doing collaborative work, even if I don't have the the, the knowledge. So again, definitely not replace what I do, but just one more tool in our in the way we do this. And the more we do scholars, such as scholars of this, I think the more our research is going to be advanced to different, a new, and exciting avenues. That's great. That's great. It's really exciting. Um, I, I think I want to take the privilege of posing the, the last question, which might be another second reader question. So be warned. Um, yeah. But it, it's a methodological question, which is if we can map out these net these networks and these relationships, and it seems like right now you're mapping out um, knowledge of texts, shared reading of texts, and geographical spread across time. So you have kind of three different plot points there, it seems. Like what what do we learn socially based on that? So reading can be a very passive thing. Um, it does, it need not indicate a high degree of social interaction, but it also might. So where do you go with, and what, what have you done with kind of working out the problem of how to interpret the data that you're collecting with this networked analysis? Um, I think what's good about network analysis that it can actually you can use it in whatever ways you want, right? You can, and, and the more complex, the better. That's the thing about network analysis, that um, it's crude, right? I need a dot and a line, and it's very hard. That was the hardest thing to work with Yossi, because Yossi says, the bat eats that food from that bat or not, right? For him, it's easy. And he said, you know, you give me the dot and line and I'll make the network. I'm like, wait, I just spent 60 pages in my book explaining that dot and line. What are you talking about just dot and line? It was very hard. To, to work in a crude way. I think it's worth it, but I think also what's worth about it is that the simplicity and the crudeness of presenting information in dots and lines allows for putting a lot of information in. So for example, I can add, you, you said you asked this, and let me add, ask more, right? We can add the rest and sources. I can map them to material evidence. Is it some of this in text? Some of this could be 
art. Some of this can be archaeological find. I can add a lot of stuff and like, you know, give different colors or different lines, or this, right? So we can add a lot of information into that. It causes a slew of mythological problems, right? Do, does it signal when this tradition was formed or when, what is it, it came into contact? Does the geographical thing suggest where it came from? This is what I did or where it entered the Talmud, right? All this is, it, we have to deal with a lot of questions and be very honest about the limitations of what the network analysis presents. And that's okay. I'm fine with that because again, it doesn't replace my work. It just gives me another tool of viewing, like taking a step back and getting like a, a view of, of the, the of, I don't know, it's like I said, we had a snow day today, right? And the kids are home and we had a snowstorm. This is why I'm not in Boston and we haven't had a lot of snow and we went sliding with the kids. So the problem was every time we look for a hill to slide from, from afar, it looks very nice, right? There's like slides and you can, you can imagine yourself sliding on the thing with the plastic. And the closer you get, you can see the bumps or whatever. And my kids are very scared of like, you know, falling. So you have to like choose the right, you know what I mean, right? Every time you have to, the, the details get complicated. But at the end of the day, you know, you see a nice, you know, hill that it's important to take a step back, look at the hill and say, that's a good hill to slide on. Well, you go in, it's also important to notice, you know, what the bumps and, and, and different, you know, mountains and, and you know, the, the missing English words to describe snow, but all kinds of like, you know, rough edges to the snow. And that's important too. Both are important to go the micro and the uh, micro level, right? You have to step back and look at the big picture that gives us certain tools and also the little, uh, 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 tools as well. Good. And maybe, uh, actually, I do have, this is my actual last question, which is, and this is for you to maybe reflect on the meaning of your work, which is you're seeming to suggest that Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, others knew each other and our image of hermetically sealed communities in the past isn't a model that maybe necessarily works all the time or ever did. And so, how does that speak to to our present moment, or or can it at all, or is that part of what motivates your work also? So I have to say something. Um, I am very happy that I'm studying something that you know all my subjects are dead and have been for a long time, fifteen hundred years, and I can say uh, their ideology in many many cases are not mine. They were sexist. They were male. They were you know a lot of the time racist. They had a lot of you know ideas and ideology that worked 1500 years ago, and that's fine to understand that in their context. I like these texts. I, they're, 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 they're part of my own tradition, but they're part of the you know, Western tradition as a whole, the, the, the tradition, not just Western, Eastern as well. And this is, this is, this is, this is a cool text. It's always surprising, but I, I, I enjoy the, the, the difference in time, the 1500 years. It, it makes me less uncomfortable with what I read sometimes because it's, you know, I can understand them in their time, in their place, and we should. Having said all that, I can't ignore the fact that these texts have ramifications for the life I lived today, and especially um, the what's happening now in Israel, which breaks my heart and has a direct influence to what's found in those texts. We have um, religious fractions in the government that want to bring us back to following some of those rules which mm -hmm. will be very bad for women, for example, mm -hmm. which will be very bad for our treatment of others. So we can't ignore the fact that these texts have actual ramification for the world that we live in. And that's something that we can ignore and I don't ignore. And I have to admit that each text has um, cultural ramification that we have to deal with and be very honest and very brave to say our culture has bad parts to it. And we have to come back and be very, very clear and critical of the stuff that don't work and shouldn't work and we shouldn't follow. And I'm very, very clear about this. The good things about these texts is that they do suggest when we talk about Jewish Christian relations, they do suggest that people were complicated then and they're complicated now. And it was never simple to interact with other religious cultures. It was never simple. We kind of like enjoy in the past, so and so, and this is what, no. Always when people were in contact, it was complicated. They knew much more about each other than we previously thought. 
they had to deal with it. They were anxious about this. They were mocking. They were not nice. But sometimes they thought, oh, that's a good idea. We should adopt that. That happened in the past. It happened in the present. And we shouldn't imagine the past that's different than our present. And that's a good thing to remember. Cultures are complicated. People are complicated. And religious communities, when they come in contact, are complicated. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. That's spoken like a good teacher. And I'll just note a final comment here from Scott Baerbaum, who was a student of yours at Maya class in Newton 10 years ago. And uh, your influence is a legacy on him. Um, I know some of your other students who also feel the same way. Um, This brings us to the conclusion of our evening. Um, To note, um, I understand, I believe that the slides will be shared uh, to the to those who registered before, uh, there was some request for a map before. Um, the codes will be shared. Uh, there's people are working on some technical questions with the codes right now. Our information on that will be shared as well. Um, uh, I'm so appreciative, Michal, that you were here with us today. I'm sad it couldn't be in person, but you come to Boston, I'll buy you dinner. I'll bring Franz along and we'll have a good time. I, uh, I hold you to this promise. Yes, and I, I hope you consider yourself a friend of the Center for Christian Jewish Thank Learning you. and that uh, our relationships here continue as well. Thank you all for being part of our evening tonight. You posed some wonderful questions. Uh, the video of this event should be available within a week or so, and that will be on our YouTube channel that you can access through our uh, website of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning. So thank you all and have a good night. Thank you, Michal. Thank you. Dan, can you also copy all the comments and send them to me? Uh, I believe that's possible. Uh, We won't shut down until Sam uh, makes sure that happens. Thank you all for joining us. And Dan, thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, you're very welcome. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.